Hello and welcome to Happy Hour again. Coming to you today from the beautiful social distancing home studios located in Ventura and Camarillo, California. Welcome back to Happy Hour again. I am Curtis Taylor. I'm here with Joby Yobi and Jason Hendrick. And I am delighted to introduce to you Brenda McGee. Hello, Brenda. Hi. Welcome to the show. Hello, Brenda. Morning, Brenda. Hi, guys. Good morning. So Thanks. one of one of the um, I just want to throw out some social media stuff for you so you can find Brenda McGee uh, on Facebook. If you go to I think your Facebook page is um, shoot. Now I'm losing it. Brewery Brewery Writer. Brewery Writer. Yeah. Brewery Writer um, is the Facebook page. You can find um, find her there through that. Uh, the book that we're going to be um, um, promoting today is called Brewing in Milwaukee. And you can find that just about anywhere you get books. It's uh, available through Arcadia Publishing. So if you go to ArcadiaPublishing.com. Um, I also have found it on um, Amazon in both the Kindle version and um, paperback and hardback. So um, for those of you who are more visually driven as I am, one, the book has lots of beautiful photography and will help guide you through the history. But also, if you want to pick it up and need to know what to look for, it looks like this right there, Brewing in Milwaukee by Brenda McGee. So make sure to pick up a copy of that. That's right. I have, um, I have a, a, a book overlay and I'm going to actually hide it just a moment so that we can take, take a look here uh, because right next to the book is Jason's uh, Milwaukee beer. He's got a, a full glass of PBR sitting <laughs> next to it. And for those so, of well, you- I've got one in hand, but that one is in honor of you two guys who failed to pour your PBR today and are drinking coffee instead. <laughs> so I've got one glass by the book in honor of the whole tradition. And I've got one that is for me only. That's right. So, uh, so Brenda, um, let's, let's just start with uh, why, uh, like your roots as a historian, when did you, when were you, when did you know that looking at history was something that you wanted to spend your life um, doing? Well, I'm an East Coast girl. I was born and raised in Staten Island, New York. And I was very fortunate enough to be able to be exposed to history from a very early age. There were tons of museums that my family took me to exploring and just doing research. And the first museum I ever walked into was on Staten Island was a uh, firehouse museum. And I just fell in love with everything about it. You know, the history, how far it dated back and things like that. Um, so through high school and, you know, through college, I excelled. History was my thing. Um, after I met my husband, who was in the Marines, we traveled around. I was a stay-at-home wife. Once my kids went to school, the older ones in college, I decided to return to college. We were living in Milwaukee at the time, and I enrolled at Marquette University. And um, I came out of there with a BA in history and a um, uh, family studies. And so I thought that I wanted to teach that for a while, and I didn't want to be stuck in the classroom. So I wanted some other way to use my degree, use the knowledge I had gained, and find an interest. So that led me to historical societies and other local instructional possibilities. And uh, so that's where my background in history came from. I see in your profile, Brenda, that you are a member of the Milwaukee County and Franklin Historical Societies. Are you still an active member in both of those? Yes. Yes. So you really embraced the Milwaukee, even though you're an East Coast girl by heart, you really embraced where you were living and got your roots oh, that, settled into Milwaukee. Definitely. Milwaukee was just wonderful. It's a wonderful place for any, anyone. But for a historian, it dates back so richly that it was because I'm that, I'm that parent historian that no matter where we go on a vacation, you know, I find something historical. Oh, remember this, look at that, note that. Isn't this great? Isn't that cool? Type of a thing. And so if we were gonna plan anywhere, my kids would always say, okay, what's the backstory to this mom? Mm -hmm. You know, type of a thing. But that I always found something interesting or historical about it because it's, especially if it's in your own community, there's such a backdrop for everything else that's going forward from there that I thought, and I, as far as local history, I felt that's where I could make the best connection and the most contribution. And so, I, go ahead, go Jace. Ahead, Curtis. Sorry. 
Well, I'm just well, looking. I, I want to get a little tidbit about the fact that you're still, because uh, I am an Indiana boy now living in California. And so I appreciate what you're saying in terms of really digging into the roots and the local piece. And if it weren't for some of that aspect with me, I wouldn't have met Joby and Curtis, you know, because the beer scene um, really of the local area of Ventura County brought us together in a lot of ways. And so the fact that we're even now, however many years later, a friendship talking about beer and how it relates to our communities and now having you on as a guest, you know, really is a pretty cool experience. So I appreciate you being on. Well, I appreciate you inviting me. It's, it's exciting. And by the way, I now live in Indiana. <laughs> there you go. Well, and I think, you know, your, your history, the, as being the, the history mama and, and everyone looking to, to understand where we're going, that's very similar to us in, in the beer as we would travel across the country for family vacations. Um, you know, we would, we're, we're certainly looking at the sites and, and enjoying the trip, but all of our vacation or all of our, whether it's lunch or dinner stops or, or stopping for the night, those all revolved around beer. And, um, you know, so we, I can certainly understand how uh, looking through um, planning out a family vacation and where are the historical sites to learn along the way is, is an important kind of thing. So one of those important spots, though, is when you were living in um, kind of the, the background for the book Brewing in Milwaukee, you, um, you were kind of surrounded by um, this history, this brewing history. So um, can you tell us what, what sort of the, um, the, the circumstances of you realizing that there was all of this rich brewing history that surrounded you? Well, I, I knew that when we came to Milwaukee from the East Coast, I knew that, you know, what I had seen, Happy Days was going on at that time. Laverne and Shirley were on. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I knew about beer. I am not a beer drinker, so at all. You know, I know my husband, um, his favorite at, when he was younger was Schlitz, and he'll ask for it in the restaurant today if you have it. And some people look at him like, what? <laughs> and some people say, yeah, yeah, we know about that. But um, if you look at a map of, of Milwaukee, it's actually divided into quadrants. And so there's north, south, east, and west. If you live on the east side where I was employed is all older Victorians um, and a lot of brewery row because there were quite a few breweries at that time. The company I was working in lived in an old Victorian owned by Christopher Schultz. Christopher Scholes was an inventor, a politician, and a newspaper editor. He invented the typewriter. My office, I was a front end manager, so the reception area was a, a, a historical museum in itself. There were just tons and tons of typewriters of every keyboard, of every style, of every year. And so I really relished people would come in and wanted to, I would tell them the story about everything. But researching Christopher Scholes, I found that because he's so involved in the city of Milwaukee, that I would imagine, and if you're a historian and or an Arthur, you spend a lot of time imagining your subject. So before I even called it a subject, I was imagining what it would be like for Christopher Scholes to be inviting all of these movers and shakers from Milwaukee into his home. And I'm thinking about all of the important people who would cross his threshold. And in the research that I did, I found out that it was many of the brewing giants beside the politicians and, you know, and whomever else. And, uh, but what spurred my interest was to go from the east side, which is directly on Lake Michigan, to go home, I had to get to nine, the Highway 90, Interstate 95. I had to cross through, um, I didn't have to, but I chose to, cross through the old Paps factory buildings that were in disrepair, they were decaying, they were all shuttered. And I used to think, well, you know, this is pretty neat. Then day after day, you know, I would think, and I got so involved in it from the research that I was doing, I became to imagine what it would have been like to, in the time of Captain Paps to be able to be there. I could hear the clanking of the bottles onto the wagons. I could hear the hoof beats clumping on the stone walkways. I can hear Captain 
shouting to the workers, you know, to do this. I was starting to imagine all of this. And then it's almost as though, and I say that my subjects choose me, it's almost as though it cried out to me to tell a story. And I pride myself on that. That's the author I am. I love to tell the story of something, the subject. And so that's how I got involved in it. And the more research I did, I became very personally invested because I felt my location to where I was working, having to travel in through here, knowing the background story to everything. It just drew me in. And I literally had to tell the story. But before I decided definitely if I would do it, I didn't want just I didn't want to write just another beer book. I wanted to write a book that would be interesting, that somebody would pick up and say, well, especially that front cover, you know, what is this about? So I needed to tell the story of beer, not just report about it, not just report on the breweries and, you know, when they existed, when they shuttered and things like that, because they were so involved, all these individual players, literally, in each other's lives, even though they were foes majority of the time. But it, they were everything was so involved. And I became invested and involved in it as well. And um, so that's how it, it evolved. It was very personal for me. I'm thinking as you're talking about this in, in this, the, the, the brewery row or the brewery campus kind of area. And I have been to, um, on two occasions, I've been to what I would guess is the Miller campus um, and have done um, two brewery tours there just because I was in Milwaukee. So what am I going to do? Right. So uh, of course, as a beer geek, just go and then, and then go and sit in and then get to um, sample some of the, the beers afterwards. But I'm wondering about um, the, the, the overall size. So, uh, Brenda, I'm sure that you've been through the or driven past or even through the the middle of the uh, um, the Miller campus, right? Yeah. And and I one of the things that strikes me that that was so um, that I wasn't expecting, I guess I should say, was the size of the campus, and that it was um, it, it appeared to me if my, maybe my recollection isn't quite right, but it was blocks and you could drive through it and it was, there was something in this building and then it would move over to this building. Is that the kind of, of layout that the other breweries had as well? I mean, it, it, it's so different from microbreweries now that it's a big building, but it's nothing like what I remember as we're walking through the streets and, and, and you know, skywalks between them. Oh, definitely. If you're okay, so where you are at Miller, we are the east side is about two, maybe three miles east of Miller to the lake. And uh, so you've got four of those huge complexes contained in one area. You've got, uh, and so each, as you said, each of these are blocks and blocks long as they are wide, and they are total communities. So you have these employees that are working there. They're living very close to the factory because they have no other way to get there but walk. And whether it was made a point of, but they actually became a community. So if you were an employee at Paps or Schlitz, this is where you lived, worked, and died. Every part, every aspect of your life revolved around the brewery. So not only did you work there, you most likely had your family members working there, your uncle, your father, your brothers, your whomever. You lived very close to the brewery. They had many organizations within the brewery system. So they had clubs for men and women. They had, uh, they had their own hospitals. They had their own, um, their own banking systems, their own banks that they put up. As they grew and prospered and times changed, they had different things like they would have um, parks and picnic halls and theaters and uh, dance hall that were connected to each of these breweries and just of uh, like huge huge you know sizes of everything and it's it's very to me it's just amazing to think about one how huge it was 
and how involved that they had their employees. And um, sometimes you think of, of it as, you know, like controlling, but they actually, that was part of the aspect of wanting to be an employee. If you kept your employee happy, you didn't need to retrain people. You didn't have to worry about rehiring people. And where else would they go? You no, know, yeah, they could go to another brewery. That probably wouldn't look so good if you're coming from Pabst and you want to work at Schlitz. But um, so their whole life and aspect of, of that was a community. There's, there's a couple of things in, in what you were just talking about uh, that one was this, this sort of um, this community. And I think of, of uh, that these were immigrants largely that were coming, at least in the early days, that had moved into Milwaukee to do this. But if they were coming from Europe, Joby and Jason, you both have, have seen this too, as, as when you're traveling, that each one of these small towns has their own brewery. And it's very, I, go ahead. Yeah. The, a lot of the, I was going to say from my experience when I was in Europe, the community does develop around that industry. And for those of you listening, we're talking to Brent, excuse me, Brenda McGee, historian, author of brewing in Milwaukee, part of the images of America series. Joby, you know, based on what Curtis and Brenda are saying, the only thing I can equate to from the place I've been here in California is maybe Firestone or you've been to Sierra Nevada in terms of how ingrained in terms of helping to the community develop around that industry. Can you speak a little bit about what you saw up at Sierra Nevada and maybe does that equate to in a modern day sense, what we're describing with Brenda and Curtis? Yeah, I think that, uh, I think what you're saying about the whole community is that we usually equate it with one brewery. And I think we already talked about three already in, in Milwaukee. And so I think, uh, I apologize for the background noise there. The, the difference would be we equate it to Firestone, Stone in San Diego, like some of these front runner uh, breweries. But I think to have several in the same city, I think, you know, we're seeing that with the, with the smaller breweries now, but to have a huge scene like that and to have them all be in the same city, I think that's something I've never experienced mm -hmm. as far as that. But I know that our breweries definitely have, um, you go to Sierra Nevada or you go to Chico, not Sierra Nevada, you go to Chico, and it is Sierra Nevada, and it's uh, people that go to school there work, try to work at Sierra Nevada. Um, the biggest thing I can equate it to is Jack Daniels. Um, if you go to Lynchburg, Tennessee, everybody has either worked for Jack Daniels or will work for Jack Daniels at some point in in their life. And so that was something, you know, you don't we don't have something tangible like that. And so I think Jack Daniels is my biggest uh, example, and just, and it was a town of 700 people, so it was. Pretty cool to see, but yes, everybody worked there. Everybody, uh, just like you said, Brenda, everybody had something to do with the culture of the distillery. Um, they want to work there, and they're, you know they're happy to work there. And it's a, there's a sense of pride of working there. And, now, Brenda, and, and you that, not really being a beer drinker, um, <laughs> after you've done all this research and you really start putting pen to paper and coming up with the story, uh, there's two things I want to know. One, did you start to gravitate towards any beer whatsoever? And or how do you start in a totally different direction? How do you start picking out the photography and how do you work through the process of getting the imagery to really fit in with the story you're telling? Well, as I said in the beginning, I wanted to put a different spin on this. So my goal was to research images that most likely would not have been in any other book. And so I, I sought out individuals that um, I felt could help me, such as, and what I, interesting I found about this, that associating yourself with beer, the beer industry, there are so many different aspects of collectors out there. So you've got bottle collectors, bottle cap collectors, um, imagery, you've got um, any type of marketing, marketing material that's out there. There are clubs, there are, you know, different groups of people that get together. And so I targeted those groups specifically that were the collectors. And then I researched any family members that remained in Milwaukee. And my introduction was written by Fred Gettleman, who is a grand, great, he would be the great grandson of the original founder. And um, it was really neat because in his basement, he has a whole, um, the, the, kettles and and now if you've any of you have been to a brewery you know how large a kettle is it's like a and that's in his basement 
<laughs> yeah, in his basement, all put together. And uh, so I, I depended a lot on the collectors and those that were very fond of the beverage. But if you notice in my book, I do give credit to both the Milwaukee Historical Society and the State Historical Society. And um, anybody, as I said, I try to encourage authors to move, you know, move out of their, their safe place. But my imagery that I got from the historical societies, it was very expensive because I had to pay for each individual imagery. So I tried to defray the cost by going to collectors and other people who would have things like that that could help me. Uh, Brenda, I'm, that, I'm, go ahead, I'm, curious, I'm okay. curious about rivalries. Uh, did you come across any anything like that in your research? Is there, I mean, I know, so I'm a, I'm a West Coast, I'm born and raised. We don't have that much history out here, as you guys know, compared to the rest of the country. Our biggest thing was either, uh, <laughs> You were either a you were either a Miller or you were a Budweiser a guy out here. That was that was the two. You were either Bud Light or Miller Light. Um, but in Milwaukee, is there something like that? Did you find that in your studies? Is there a loyalty to to the brands? Oh, definitely. It's especially if you are if you come from a family that a long line of relatives that work for either or any of those breweries, and. Um, you know, and it's funny because, you know, when you talk about the immigrants and they distinctly settled in different areas. If you were Italian, you went to the Italian area and so forth. And um, each of those areas would have what they called the Tide House. It was a, a pub located on the corner, situated with its entry doorway at an angle. So you knew right away where it was. Some of the breweries like Schlitz, they would have this... Um, a, a large globe that would sit at the top of the entrance. So your neighborhood, your family heritage, your, you know, your link to a brewery, that would be it. But I think when people think of, of Milwaukee, I think PBR is the number one thing that, yeah, Miller, Miller's uh, close tie maybe, but uh, I think they always think PBR because that, that, is always considered a working man's, you know, type air besides Schlitz. But yeah. Um, yeah, so there's that little bit of, you know, competition that this is better than the other, but I think it has more has to do with um, your association. Well, I think based on what you just said too, um, I actually have a 24 ounce can of Pabst Blue Ribbon in my hand and I've got for today's show. I would agree with your assessment that it's considered a working man's beer and Schlitz as well. You know, my dad drinks, some of these kinds of things back home. Um, you know, he's in his mid sixties and remembers these growing up. These were like his cheap, quick go-to beers, especially after mowing the lawn. But looking at the can, it says established in Milwaukee, 1844. So those of you who are listening right now to Brenda McGee and our discussion, I mean, that gets you right into the thick of how far back the brewing history goes to Milwaukee. You know, 1844 is no turn around the corner. That's a ways back. Yes. Yeah, it was. And it, um, and it's amazing when you think how it gets to say, especially for, for Paps, it started out as best. They had, uh, so you had four brothers that came over from Germany with the prompting of their dad, who had an existing brewery in Germany. He sends his sons over to Milwaukee because of the German immigration. And their idea was to start a vinegar factory because they're German. You know, they need, everything has got vinegar or it's processed with vinegar. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I think sauerkraut. And uh, so they found out, you know, after a while, well, you know, there's something else is going on here. Yeah, all these Germans, but they're all looking for something else. They've got, you know, these small little factories. And at that time, a lot of individuals were brewing. So we go back to that microbrewery, home brewing thing where it's kind of started. And uh, he, so the boys say, well, you know, there's something different. I think we're going to scrape the vinegar idea and we're going to call, let dad know that there's an opportunity here for us. And so dad comes out and he's Jacob Best Sr. He comes out and sells the fact the the brewery in, in Germany comes over with his little recipe and he was going to brew lager. And because at the time there was a lot of ale 
uh, and the, the distilling, you know, you had the Irish here, you had the British that were here, and it was the ale and the whiskey and things like that. And so with the German population, they found a need to be able to satisfy their thirst with their lager. And so that's how the best um, brewery starts. And uh, they do that for a couple of years, and then two of the boys leave and they go down the road, which would be equivalent to going to the Miller Brewery now. And they start their own brewery, which is called Plank Road Brewery. And um, they do that for a couple of years and they decide to go back, follow the family business. They shut down that brewery. And in the meantime, they're doing all of this you know, coming and going. All these other breweries are starting to pop up as well. And they're all with the purpose of quenching the thirst of the German population. There, you know, if you're going to have a German population, you, you're going to have, <laughs> I mean, it's a prerequisite that there's going to be some kind of um, beer. And, and unless it's a wheat beer, I mean, everything else, I'm just trying to think of what else there is. It's, it's yeah, it's just, it's all lager beers, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. think that's, that. those are some of the, you know, one of the things, Brenda, when we were kind of prepping for this, I found really interesting, you're kind of hinting at it was that there are these these different immigration populations and so there's these these um these and and their um their drinking habits are all different the whole way around and and so the the english and the irish who are used to ales and then you have so there's these small breweries that are all popping up to to f like satisfy that need but then when that demographic changes then you have to then you know it seems like these four people that we're talking about the, the blatz millers paps and schlitz that they were there at a pivotal moment in time in order to to like the pole position essentially mm -hmm. for this new wave of thirst yes definitely and out of the i always call them the big four out of the four miller was the only one that didn't come from a family of brewery, brewers. He had, uh, he was just a middle-class merchant who thought that that would be very interesting to get into. He had a relative that lived in France that was distilling or some other type of, um, of uh, beverage that he was interested in. He then earned enough money to send himself through brewery school and uh, Again, following the German immigration, decided to try out America, came to New York, uh, scouted. He was very, very intelligent as far as the dedication to learn something that he was not familiar with, but also where he would be able to strike out on his own and make a success of it. And so all through his research in the year he spent in New York, he found that Milwaukee was the place to be. And he takes you know, his, the couple of dollars he's got left heads to Milwaukee and um, he finds a brewery, a small brewery down in Milwaukee and center of town close to the lake. And um, he's employed there and then he, he does such a great job. He becomes a manager. And uh, then eventually the, you know, how things go that um, they, they just boom. And, one thing about Milwaukee, which is all connected in the immigration of the Irish, the British, Germans, Italians, and all of that, is back in the 1840s. Now, if you've seen a map of Wisconsin, we're, we are pretty large. And so the state of Wisconsin decided that they needed to have um, workers. They needed to increase the population. So they made up these brochures, come to America, America, land of opportunity, and all these different things about the water, the, the shipping, the, um, the land, you know, all these possibilities. Come to America, it's, it's for you. And um, so all of that advertising that they did, which is how they encouraged all of the immigrations to come. Now, once they got here, just like any other immigrant, they were, you know, they were tested, they were given exams, they were, you know, checked for their health condition and all of that. But um, it was, it truly was the land of opportunity. And what made it so extensively opportunist was that its location. 
It was located on the, um, on the Great Lake, Michigan, and as well as the Milwaukee River. And so it was very fertile land. You had the water for uh, a waterway to be able to, you know, move your goods eventually to be able to use the water in the processing of the beer. And um, the water, the water and the, the clay of the water also afforded the bricks. Milwaukee is known as Cream City Brick City because the bricks are made from the clay of the riverbanks. And when they dried, they were very creamy, white, beigey color. So most of the bricks in that time period come from that clay. So that's why we're known as Cream City, because of the color of the bricks. But it, um, so it was such a catalytic event, monumental event, that all of these came together at that one time period from 1840 is the biggest boom. But starting from 1830, you know, right up to the 1900s, with the late 1800s being the golden, the golden time of the beer baron, but it, it all had to come together. It, you know, if you had one part missing, it wouldn't have worked. Well, and it's, I would like to lobby for the cream city designation to also apply to the, the beautiful creamy foam head that comes out on the beer, considering the yes. beer history and all the breweries that are in the city. Um, when we think about this book in paperback version, it's not a, a thick book, which it's a nice, easy read again, in terms of um, the layout and the visualization of all the imagery, but it does have rich content. What's the timeline that you had to work within? How, how long did it take you really to evolve this book and get it into publishing? Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I like to tell the backstory to everything so people kind of get a foundation of what's going on. So I started with the early exploration of French coming down from Canada. I even go back further than that, talking about Native Americans traveling from the East Coast that are pushed through due to settlement that are pushed west. And um, so I start there, and it was very difficult to get imagery from that time period, I must say. And uh, so I had to depend a lot on, on maps and, um, you know, logs of that French explorers kept and things like that, and trying to decipher the descriptions that you, they're using to pinpoint the time and the places that they were at. So I go from early, uh, early exploration, and I went all the way up through... Now that was 2014. I went all the way up to microbrewery and homebrewery. So that was, what is that, 100 and, I don't know, I'm not good at math, guys. It's, it's a long Sorry. time. Well, you just, Call it 150 long years. Time. You, yeah. And you just mentioned um, the challenge with like maps and imagery from the earlier time periods that you were researching. Were there any stumbling blocks that you ran into where you're like, you know what, maybe, maybe I don't want to continue this book. Maybe it's just not worth it to me at this point. Well, it, I did have, I did have, it, well, going back to the earliest part, like I said, the, the um, exploration was for me the most difficult. When I got to the point where I actually had imagery where I needed for some of the breweries, it was difficult to find some people who would want to share their, their information. Okay. So I, I don't talk about it, but I will mention it this time when, when I decided to do this book, I did my proposal to the, to the publisher. And um, they came back to me and they said, well, you know, someone else had tried this subject before, but they pulled out. And I said, why? You know, this is so interesting. And it's because they felt, the individual that had pulled out, they felt that all of their research was theirs. They had spent all that time, years and years, you know, files and, and booklets and notes and everything like that, years of dedication to do that. And they felt that publishing it, somebody would steal it. I, on the other hand, I feel that when you research and, and publish it, even though you dedicate so much of your time of your life to do that, you need to publish it. You need to have other people understand. You need to have other people use that research that you've got. They're, they're not stealing it. 
they're basing it off of your good faith, you're telling the truth, and that there's a reason you told this story. And so that's how I feel about it. And I'm proud of the fact that my book is in the Smithsonian as a reference material. And so- Very Cool, congratulations. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I, I feel that is my kudos for, for spending the time, doing the research, contacting the people that have the knowledge, willing to share with me, and that I in turn can take that, credit them, and continue the story and take it forward. I think about the, 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 the hoarding sort of um, mentality of that too. Like this is all mine and I'm not going to share it with anyone, you know. Well, and we can relate to that with some of the beer geeks used to uh, acquire the very sought after bottles of brew. And it's like, no, 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 it's mine. I, I want to enjoy yeah. this just for myself. But uh, Joby, you, you and I having worked in and used to owning a, a tap room and seeing the communal aspects of beer can really relates i would like to say i can relate to the opposite of that i think it's very much a sharing um product it's very much an engagement and a socialization that occurs around beer and if anyone is hoarding their piece of that industry shame on them exactly yes yes it does right, yeah um, go ahead Joby. no no i was just going to ask you if anybody you said uh there were some people that didn't want to share their possibly their imagery or information I'm wondering kind of going even deeper and darker into that. Was there anybody that didn't want you to tell some of these stories or anybody from these families that was, you know, that felt um, they didn't want this information to be out for whatever reason? Well, a, a lot of it was because I came from the outside. I didn't know anybody who worked in any breweries. I didn't drink beer. I didn't know anybody. So I was starting from completely scratch. I had nothing to go on. And so for me to go and being female, to go and into these organizations and these groups, I was, I was looked at very cautiously. And that, um, you know, like, who am I? And, and why do I want this? And why do I want these images right. like that? And, um, you know, and as I tried to tell them, explain to them, that I wanted to tell this wonderful story of our heritage. You know, it, it's not just beer, it's heritage that's going on here. And I, oh, okay, you know, we got that. Then, then they were relaxed and they would listen, you know, to my, my interests and, you know, they would tell me these things and then they would share photographs. And um, so it was difficult at first but then, you know, people understood what I was trying to do, and then I became accepted and welcome. And yeah, so yeah. that made me that made me feel good. I was able to breach that resistance, and um, you know, just become one of the old guys. Yeah, I imagine these many of these companies are many of these breweries are now corporations, and I'm thinking of Pabst Blue Ribbon. They had a resurgence. I mean, with the uh, with the, the hipsters, I guess that's okay to say. We're, we're all older, so we could say the hipsters, but <laughs> Pabst is one of those brands where somebody took it and marketed it and and um, gave it a new life, definitely. Probably doing better, maybe better than ever. I don't know. Well, um, I, oh, yeah, in 1996, Pabst actually shut down. And, you know, they completely closed everything. Nobody cared. They boarded stuff up. You know, you'd see stuff written all over and stuff was crumbling. I can imagine with the insurance that they carried, you know, whoever it was that they had to carry the insurance for that. But um, trying to think when it was, I think it was, let me see, there was a gentleman out of California. And what is his name? I have it here. His, I like that you have your nose right at the fingertips there, Brendan. You're like, oh, hold on a second. Let me just grab my paperwork. That's beautiful. Yeah. And, he, um, he was involved in a liquor company, I think, or something like that. Yeah, he had, um, he was a partner in, let's see, I have it here. He was a partner in some other organizations that had many different food industry oriented businesses. His name was, um, let's see what his name was. I got it here somewhere. 
but um, he bought, after Pabst shut down, Miller, Pabst negotiated with Miller to brew all their labels, whatever remained. And so that was Pabst Blue Ribbon, it was um, uh, a couple of the other ones. So, and so that was the contract. Well, the contract ran out in 2020, February of 2020. And Miller didn't want to do it anymore. They felt that they just didn't want to do it for whatever their reasoning. And so Pabst, that was the holders of Pabst, felt Miller was trying to um, sub, um, defeat them. And they renegotiated the contract, so they're actually going to keep producing. But um, the gentleman that bought Pabst, I had read about it, I guess it must have been like 2016 or so that there was somebody was interested and everybody in Milwaukee was really excited because they said that they would try to get them to bring, come back to Milwaukee to brew. And little did they know that it was being brewed just down the road. Yeah. And um, so, and that, to, to try to get that out of Miller, that was very difficult. And I just had a lot of connections and then I found out that Miller was still brewing it for them. But um, so this gentleman he, who purchased it decides that now he's got this company, what are we going to do? So I sent him my book and I said, if this will help you make a decision to come back to Milwaukee, everybody would be grateful. And so I don't know whether or not my book had any influence on him or not. I hope so. But he came back <laughs> and he bought a couple of the buildings and he refurbished them. And now they have, um, he's got another label going on and it is called the Pilot House. And that's where in the Pabst um, buildings, there's a part, it was a church and then Pabst bought it from the, the, um, from the church, recreated it into a, a beer hall and restaurant. He had training in the basement for the employees. And uh, then after they shut down in 96, they just, it just um, it resurged with the new owner. And so it's now called the wheelhouse in um, with kudos to Captain Paps because he used to be a Great Lakes sailor. And um, they have this label now. I think there's three or four different labels coming out of that. But so Paps did return. Nice. And um, but so, yeah, it's really cool. Um, if you guys get a chance to check out the website for that. They got a really cool marketing plan. And they're pretty smart too. The, some of the areas that they've inserted themselves, like you're saying from the marketing strategy, Joby, you referenced hipsters. I also yeah. thought right away about, um, you know, PBR and the bull riding series. I mean, oh, yeah. to be able to align yourself with a stereotypical tough guy activity and, you know, sporting event, I think get your brand out in front of all the right kind of people that, are going to help support that brand. And so I, I can't help but picture guys in chaps, cowboy hats and a can of PBR in their hand after getting off a big, strong bull. And that just, you know, really speaks to the marketing engine behind it. Yeah. There's a, I forget what page it is, but there's an image I have in there of the marketing director for Pabst and he's sitting in his office and on the wall, there are every aspect of marketing material you could possibly think of. And when I found that image, I thought, oh, I have to have this because I'm a, a lot of people today, when they think about somebody or a business or something from the 1800s, they think everybody is not educated, don't know anything. They don't know anything about business and whatever. And especially when it comes to marketing, they were so inept at that time to think about marketing. And all the things that went into it and, um, you know, how they develop marketing. And, you know, it, it's pretty amazing when you think of it that they were so astute, you know, to have all these placards and, and grocery stores where they sold them or, you know, the Tide houses connected to a brewery that, that they were pretty, pretty smart back in the 1800s. You know, I, as you're talking about this, I keep thinking about this, the, the history, the brewing history, you're talking, starting probably the early 1800s, where 1840 was sort of that height or that, that first big boom, all the way through now. And 
there, there has to be um, in the process of editing things that there that had to be cut and that what I'm, I'm assuming that would be probably you had to make some serious you had to weigh these things like this is a really great story to tell this is but i need to cut down to whatever the page limit is or however that so what with that in mind i was just wondering are there any of these um any stories that that didn't make the cut that you were that you were particularly interested in including but just couldn't in the in you know in the effort of of edi editing this down well the publisher arcadia is a great publishing company for individuals who want to tell the story of their local history and in order to do that you have to live in that in that community to be able to write about that i can't i can't write something about ventura county in california I have to be able to live there, and which I understand because then if, when you're promoting the book, you want to know where to go and you want to have those people that you have a connection with. And I get that. And, um, but it's, you know, it comes to the point where Arcadia dictates everything to you. And as I said, this is a great publishing company for people who want to tell their little story, who want to, uh, who need the guidance. And they're really great on that. So every book is exactly the same. You, um, I really, I had, so I, I did the research and I write it. They do everything else for you. I didn't have anything to do with the cover photo imagery. Um, a lot of my photo, my photographs were rejected because it didn't, it didn't really fit what they wanted. Um, so you have um, almost 200 images, no more than that, 100 and something pages. Every image had no more than 65 words in the caption. If I was going to write the introduction to each of the chapters, I was limited on, on the, the words count in that. So it was, it was very constraining, which is good for great, for authors who are just starting out. And um, so they give you a lot of guidance. And so I was, I was upset when I would want to use some verbiage or terminology related to the period. I would get an editor that would call me up and say, well, you know, that's really not the right spelling or we're gonna change this a little bit because people won't understand. And I'd say, I'm sorry, but if this is from the era, I have to use it because then I'm not telling the truth. I need people to understand if, if I can preface what I'm going to say, use whatever it is I want to use, then people will understand why I used and what it means. And uh, so there were some stories, there was one in particular when we talk about prohibition. I have an image in there, uh, the Milwaukee Journal staff reporters, they're in the dark room drinking. And so really? I had to, yeah, I had to call, uh, contact the Milwaukee Journal to the editor where I said, I have this image. I sent them a copy of it. I said, would you, it, where, and tell them I got it from the Historical Society. I said, would you please give me permission to use this? Well, he had to go to who so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and whomever. It took me about two weeks later, he emailed me. He said, okay, we give you permission. And uh, so, except for the editor, in, in the publishing company, I really didn't have that difficulty where I had to, for me, it was just cutting the information to make it relevant to a reader today that they would understand. You know, as, as I said, I preface it with a lot of the early breweries and why they were important. And, um, you know, so it was, for me, it was limiting because I can go on forever about Miller. I can go on for even further about Schlitz and uh, their contributions to modern day Milwaukee. So I just, I had to confine it and I always had to, I always have to keep in the back of my mind to tell the story. That's my goal, just tell the story as it comes and, you know, the relevance of it. And uh, so for me, brewing in Milwaukee, it, it's not just a beer book. It's about the beer of Milwaukee. And why, and I always, as I say, I always talk about the four labels, why these four labels? 
made it around the world, known by their brand labels. You now we talked about the girl in the moon for Miller, um, the blue ribbon for um, Paps and things like that. You know, and then sometimes if you're, especially if you're somebody I think from, or well, maybe you're between the ages of 35 to, or 20 to 40, you don't know where this new Britain new label is best. You know, what does that mean? Who is that? And so when you read my book, it tells you how best, because best started, Paps started out as best, and through several issues and over a couple of generations, how it gets changed. But, um, and everything that I wrote, as I said before, I fact-checked, I made sure it was true. Um, if it was a story that someone was telling me, I prefaced that it was a story from a, you know, the grandson of the, of the shift or something like that. That not that I was just making them up somewhere, right. but um, you know, so that is so where everybody too. I'm sorry. I was just going to remind everybody that you know who we're talking to, Brenda, because I think what you're describing um, is very intriguing. I think there's a lot of opportunity if anyone who drinks beer appreciates beer is loosely affiliated with the beer culture would need to pick up this book. So we're talking to Brenda McGee, author of Brewing in Milwaukee, part of the imagery, Images of America series. Um, you can pick it up on Amazon. There's all kinds of places on online. You can grab it. And I like the insight you provided because there are a lot of these books out there and the cover is very familiar. I had the image up a few minutes ago on the video. I actually have one of these books from my hometown as well, Michigan City, Indiana. And the way you laid out why they look the same and how they come together as kind of a template really was enlightening because they're very, you know, the cover in that is also very iconic. You know, when mm -hmm. you pick this up, kind of what to expect in terms of the style okay. of read it's going to be and what kind of information you're going to get out in terms of history. So I thank you very much for opening my eyes as to why I see what I see. And Brenda, we only have a few minutes left here um, before we're going to go to our break. But one of the things that I wanted to give you um, just a few minutes to um, to plug a couple uh, your new project. And so, I mean, we've been talking about brewing in Milwaukee, but you've also have another book that you published called The Milwaukee Mile. And for racing fans, this one this is right up your alley. So, tell us about Milwaukee Mile. Milwaukee Mile is about the Milwaukee Mile, which is a uh, mile racetrack located at, in um, West Dallas, Wisconsin, adjoining the state fairgrounds. And I talk, again, I talk about the story of it, how it originated, it originated, it was a, the oval itself originally was part of a, um, a thoroughbred horse farm. Mm. And so horses would be raced on them. And uh, and then how the state fair comes to, to settle, because it used to travel around the state, how it came to settle in that particular spot. And then how the, how the oval evolves through time, starting off with one horsepower, going to um, motorcycles, uh, motored bikes, then how you go into, um, you know, the 1950s and 60s, which was really the top time for the track, and then how the Andretti's and, you know, all the other well-known race family names get involved into it, and, um, how it how it comes to modern day and what happens to it and you know how it becomes dormant uh how how the fans react to that how um, the city and the state think of this particular track it's a very valued piece of property and it does not get the activity it once had so there is a lot of um, a, a, a lot of pushback from all sides. Race fans want the track to return to its prime time, whereas the state and the city, they'd rather see the property go to a different use of, of what they have in mind. And uh, so again, I talk about the story of it, the history of it, how it evolved, um, all the players that, you know, marketed specifically and then just like the breweries, how the community 
became involved, how this so loved oval became world known and the memories that it brings people. Both of my books, when I was at a signing somewhere, it would, it was for me, the gratification was somebody would pick up my book and they'd say, you know, I remember my father would come home on Friday nights and, you know, he'd say, oh, you know, kids, we got my paycheck today and uh, this weekend we're going to do this or we're going to do that. Or I remember one time we were on a picnic and, you know, perhaps they had this great blow up balloon thing or something like that. And we all had rides or, or if we're talking about my race book, it would be, you know, guys, well, I was about 10 years old and me and Jimmy and Joe, and we would sneak under the fence where it had a hole and we could stay all day. We had enough money for a hot dog and a soda. And that's from, and then you have the people that are there, they're trading stories. And so it was, to me, that is where I, my gratification comes in. And uh, so I love telling stories because it brings so many people together. And so that is also, uh, the Milwaukee Mile is also available in all those places we were talking about too, Arcadia Publishing, Amazon, you can find that in all those places. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so we've got about one, two minutes left here. You're working on something brand new right now, right? So yeah, what, do you, I, what do we get to look forward to? I am. I'm working, I've decided to, to bite the bullet and veer off from Arcadia because one, my book really doesn't fit into, into their mold. And two, I just feel that I've learned enough with those two books and I've gone through all the motions that I can now go out on my own. I've been regimented. I know what's expected that to do accomplish my book and then to be able to find another publisher to do this. Mm -hmm. But this book is um, kind of like a, a personal, a personal voyage for myself. I consider it. Um, and so it's actually, it's centered on the East coast and it's about the music and radio and its influence on teenagers from the 60s to the 90s. So it's how music influences us, our choice of music influences us, um, how it's changed from, you know, we're just listening to the radio, then we go to vinyl, then we go to uh, uh, a track and the cassette. So I take this evolution of music and how we listen to it. And then again, now that we're these baby boomers, so yes, it is a boomer book, how we <laughs> cherish these memories because now we're taking cruises with some of these music artists where we go to all these concerts we're listening to the cover bands and they talk about some of the legislation that helps the artists um, regain some of some of their efforts and some of their uh, lost revenue over time mm -hmm. and um, so for me it's this has taken me five years now. I'm still on this subject. My first two books, From Thought and Proposal to On the Newsstand, was 18 months for both of them. And uh, so now I get discouraged. I walk away and I say, oh, my God, I'm not going to do this. This is not working. But it's just really, you know, you're talking about 40 or 50 years of research and talking to people and how... What? And why? You have you have you have our um, support definitely. I mean, there's we're especially on those cruises pretty soon. What do you mean? Well, we're more than supporters. We're going to be participants. Absolutely, you know. And my my parents are um, are boomers, and they, uh, I mean, I grew up with rock and roll oldies stations. That that's what we'd listen to, you know. Mm -hmm. So the so anything from the 50s and the 60s, I grew up with, and now all of my my music isn't even on the oldie station anymore. It's stuff from the 2000s that's now on the oldie stations. But just the importance of music and TV and those pop culture. And I think it's fascinating because uh, right now there's so many entertainment options that there's very few things that capture a collective audience anymore, that there's these fragments all over. So that sounds fascinating. I'm, I keep working on it. You don't get to give up, Brenda. <laughs> keep moving <laughs> so brenda thank you so much for joining us this morning um fabulous conversation and especially talking about some of the the, the backstory with brewing in uh brewing in milwaukee make sure that you check her website out now i'm uh the the facebook page brenda i'm losing again brewing in 
What, uh, what is your... It's it is brewing in Milwaukee, okay. but I think currently I have I think both covers are up the um, mile the race book is up as well as the brewing book cover. Mm -hmm. I think they're both up. Right. On that. So go um, give her some love on Facebook. Look at that cover. Boom! There's there brewing in Milwaukee. One. Yeah. Go. So go. Um, go give Brenda's Facebook page a like, um, mm -hmm. and then also because you're after this conversation, you know that you're going to buy brewing in Milwaukee, you know, give that a five-star rating on Amazon too. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Happy Hour. We'll be back next week with more questionable content, great guests, and drinks all around. <laughs>